Hi and welcome to another Q&A series from Mobility uh, Engineering. Hi, Ali here from uh, Mobility Engineering once again, your resident road safety expert uh, for another session of our uh, Q&A series. Thank you very much for joining us. Today's Q&A is going to be a uh, unique one. Um, basically what's happened is it's a Q&A in response to a few questions that we've had that have actually come out as a result of a blog post that we've recently released. So um, if you want, head over to our website, www.mobilityengineering.com.au and go up to the top little corner there and um, click on the blog. Um, and you'll see that we've released a few blog posts and we're regularly uh, releasing stuff there. So you can subscribe to that and um, you'll get updates as that comes through. So what you'll see over there is an info sheet. Um, and this is something that we uh, have been doing for a little while and we're gonna keep, keep on doing and do as much as possible. It's basically uh, releasing an email campaign on information to help you guys to make your job a little bit easier um, or make your transport process a bit easier and basically having a positive impact on your transport. Uh, so this uh, in latest info sheet that we uh, released was on exemptions uh, for seat wearing seatbelts. So basically there is, um, just to give you a quick little background and you can go and subscribe to our email um, and we can, or you can actually, you know what, check the uh, little caption down below. You'll see I'll put a link to the blog down there and I'll also put a link to other things that I'm going to be referring to in this uh, publication. So check that out, um, you'll click on what we can, what I'm talking about and probably make it a bit easier. But essentially we've released an information sheet on uh, seatbelt exemptions, medical exemptions on wearing seatbelts, which is uh, very common in this industry or common, um, commonly used, but what we find is actually the majority of the time it's misused. It's actually not used the right way. And it's putting a lot of people into potential liability and dangerous situations. So what we did was we clarified the requirements out um, for you guys. We uh, copy and pasted basically the information from the actual legislation um, and we put it out there and, and clarified what needs to be done. And in response to that, we emailed that through to quite a few people on our email list. And as I said before, if you want to join that email list, it's a very valuable list. You don't get any advertising, you don't really get any, anything else other than pure information to, to help you, uh, you know, make the job easy and, and make transport easy. So, so that's the purpose of our email list. If you want to be on that, join in. So this thing went out to the email list and basically what happened was we got a few questions in response asking for a bit of clarification and also some hints and tips. So I'll go through them today and I'll, uh, uh, I'll basically answer them for you and, and this email will go out through to you guys as well. So the first one was uh, Sarah from Monash Health. Uh, Sarah has actually recommended the document Assessing Fitness to Drive 2016. So the document is released by an uh, organisation called Ost Roads and the document name is called Assessing Fitness to Drive 2016. So first of all, Sarah, I wanted to say thank you very much. That is an awesome document. Um, and I want to highly recommend you contacting that, uh, well, looking up that document, and there's a link below on, uh, on how to get that document. Basically, what we have done is our info sheet was trying to be relatively simple and um, just basically giving you what the legislation is. However, this document, which is why, why I really like this document, um, this document goes a little bit further and it serves to uh, give you a little bit more clarification on actually how, what that actually means. Because sometimes we find even in our industry, even in that info sheet, we send out the legislation, it can cause a bit of confusion because sometimes legislation is sort of, you know, written in a bit of jigmo, uh, you know, jigmarole, rigmarole and, and jargon and all that kind of thing. Um, and so it can be a bit difficult to understand. So um, thank you very much for the, for the recommendation, Sarah. We're definitely going to put a link to it below and we're going to send it through to other people as well. Um, so basically the section that we're talking about is page 159 and um, the document again is called Assessing Fitness to Drive 2016. A fantastic document. Thanks Sarah for the recommendation. Really, really appreciate it. That actually then relates us to the next question that came through which was from Tracy. Tracy from Assistant School Tra Transport or Travel. And what basically Grace, uh, Tracy has said is it will be essentially in a roundabout way it will be good to have some further guidance on this. Basically, with, with respect to the layout and the content of the, the, the exemptions and certificates and so on. And that's because I'm going to guess that being part of assisted school transport, you probably see a lot of um, different uh, medical certificates and probably want a bit more guidance as to, you know, what's acceptable and what's not. So going back to Sarah's recommendation, I would actually probably recommend 
uh, that you go and look at that document, uh, which was, again, Assessing Fitness to Drive 2016. I'll put a link down below. Um, and basically, it, she was also asking if the RMS would have some kind of template. Unfortunately, there is no template from the RMS, but what we're going to do is, using this assessment to, uh, Assessing Fitness to Drive 2016 document, um, we're going to have a go at coming up with a template. If anyone's got a template they've used out there, please forward it to us. We'll publish it just so it's easier for people to use. We're not going to use anyone's t uh, intellectual property, uh, but what we want to do is help make things easier for everybody. So we're going to have a go at making a template and we'll send it out to our mailing list so you've got a resource that you can use. Now, uh, one more question we have for our info sheet number. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember what number it was, but it doesn't matter. Info sheet on medical certificates. And this one is a bit more involved and it comes from Sally at Oats Rehab. Once again, thank you very much Sally for sending me through the questions. Uh, we love getting the questions and I love doing this. Um, to be honest, it stops me from going upstairs and uh, answering the emails. So, uh, so keep them through and it means I don't have to go answer emails. I get to uh, get on, on the video and answer your questions, which is what I love doing. So essentially uh, what Sally has said is thanks for sending this through. It's good to know. You're more than welcome. I gather this is mainly referring to a driver who may have a seatbelt exemption. As a passenger without one, isn't likely to be prosecuted in the event of the accident. So as a passenger without one, isn't likely to be prosecuted. That's what um, Sally is assuming. And then the last part of the question was, does the seatbelt refer to an external seatbelt, not the wheelchair seatbelt or pelvic belt? Great questions and I've got all the answers for you here. So first of all, this exemption and this info sheet relates to anyone in the vehicle. It's not just the driver, it's also the passengers. And the way it works with this is, so to, for you to understand how the whole structure and everything works, first of all, the driver is the one who is always going to be prosecuted if people are un, uh, don't wear their seatbelt. So if the driver is not wearing the seatbelt or the passenger is not wearing their seatbelt, then the driver will be prosecuted. The driver is responsible for every single person in that, uh, in that vehicle. So if the person in the vehicle is not wearing a seatbelt, for whatever reason, then the driver is responsible. So the driver of that, of that vehicle, in the case where the passenger has a medical exemption, the driver of that vehicle needs to keep a copy of the medical exemption and they need to present it to the police when they're asked or, or a member of the authority when they're asked for it. So that is applicable to all the passengers that don't wear a seatbelt due to a medical reason. So it's very important to understand it's for everybody. The next part of the question is, um, does the seatbelt refer to an external seatbelt not the wheelchair seatbelt slash pelvic belt. So you've raised a little bit of a sensitive issue here and I wanted to sort of focus on that a little bit because it's a very important thing. First of all, it's a great question. The seatbelt that we're talking about is the seatbelt like this. That's the seatbelt that we are talking about. It's the seatbelt that's in the vehicle. I would basically put it on just like any other seatbelt. Now you also mentioned in here about the seatbelt that's actually in the wheelchair or the pelvic belt in the wheelchair. One thing I want to clarify about that is that it's actually not a seatbelt. The terminology seatbelt is incorrect. It's very, very dangerous for you to use that as a, as a restraining device for your occupant if they are in the wheelchair in the transport. So seatbelts that are built into the seat, the wheelchair seat that is, they are not seatbelts. They are not there to be restrained and they're not supposed to be used in the form of transport other than for support. A seatbelt like this which is connected to the vehicle body or the vehicle structure, which is either the vehicle seat or the body of the vehicle, that is the seatbelt that we need to be using for all occupants, including wheelchair occupants. So, if a wheelchair occupant is actually in the wheelchair using only the pelvic belt that's in the wheelchair and not connected to the body, and they're not using the seatbelt that's in the car, then they're actually breaking the law because they're not using the seatbelt. They must use one of those seatbelts and they need that if they can't use one of those seatbelts, then they will need one of those exemptions as per the guideline that we put there. So that's basically it, and that answers all the questions. As I said, thank you very much for uh, sending through those questions. If you've got any other questions other than what we've raised today, please, uh, please fire them through. We're happy to answer those questions. Check out our blog post, email to our, um, uh, sign up to our emails. We're more than happy to send you any information that you need. If you've got any further questions, fire them through and check out the links in the documentation below um, to basically, uh, sorry, in the blurb below, should I say, uh, to, to get the uh, documentation we've been talking about, which is the info sheets on the blog and also the, um, the Ostroads guideline assessing people for fitness to, to be in the vehicle. So, so yeah, we'll put all those links below. Thanks very much for joining in once again. And uh, don't forget to tune in and subscribe to our channel so you can get regular updates of all of our Q&As. Thanks very much, guys.